Um, I might start proceedings um, and welcome you all formally to our first Cradle Symposium for 2022. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here sharing this airtime with you. My name is Rola Jowie. I'm an Associate Professor at Cradle and really excited, looking forward to this presentation. It's very much um, you know, in our wheelhouse and our interests here at Cradle. I would like to start though by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm at at the moment, which are the Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung people, um, and uh, pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and any who are joining us, First Nations people who are joining us today, um, and also pay my, you know, acknowledge uh, pay my respects to uh, wherever lands you're on and also acknowledge that this land was never ceded. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Rosanna Burke from Massey University. Um, this seminar is around making assessment for work for learning. So as I mentioned, it is about how can we steer students towards really a focus on learning and towards understanding and application of knowledge that they learn through assessment. So assessment for learning, sustainable assessment. Professor Burke is Professor of Learning and Assessment and the Director of the Educational Psychology Program at the Institute of Education, Massey University in New Zealand. Her research explores the dynamic interplay between learning and assessment, how people learn in inclusive and formal and informal education settings, and also significant role of self and ipsative assessment for individual identity and learning. Um, Rosanna has a focus on sustainable assessment, student voice, children's right, and applied professional ethics. And her two recent books are Radical Collegiality Through Student Voice and Ethical and Inclusive Research with Children. So as you can see, it's very much, you know, this idea of getting the most from assessment and assessment for learning and sustainable assessment is very relevant to the sorts of things that we do here at Cradle. A little bit about how today's session is going to work. Um, the formal session is for an hour from two to three or four to five if you're in New Zealand, uh, about 40 minute discussion. Please use the chat to chat amongst yourselves. That's, un, you know, unregulated comments, ideas, thoughts, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, and please use the question and answer button for the um, formal questions that you would like to post for Rosanna at the end of her presentation. And I'll, you can, I think I'll vote if it works correctly and I'll post those to Rosanna. So without further ado, Rosanna, it's such a pleasure to have you here and over to you. Thank you, Rola. Um, kia ora tātou, uh, māori ora ki te hui, māori ora ki a tātou, māori ora ki te kaupapa o tēnei rā. Kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Welcome to this um, seminar uh, from, and as uh, Rola said, I'm coming in from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, in particular, uh, this, this is such an important area for me because it's about how to make assessment work. For learning, so to do its to do its job for learning. Um, although assessment serves a range of purposes with different roles and functions in relation to accountability at the institutional level, uh, I'm looking at it today specifically with regards to learning. And it's not really about assessment of learning or assessment for learning or assessment as learning but I'm going to focus on how assessment can work for learning. And this must mean to work for all learners. So that assessment becomes an inclusive approach that enables rather than disables learning in higher education. So I have got a slideshow that I'm going to share. And in between all this, I'm going to try and show you some examples as well. So let's see if this works. We, uh, I guess increasingly we need to make assessment approaches, develop assessment that makes learners think and that help them be creative and to prepare them for jobs being created for the future. This was a job um, advertised by NASA a few years ago and 
the, the sorts of jobs that are being created for tomorrow are not necessarily the ones that look like um, our everyday work today. Um, today. So there's always an assessment, there's always going to be multiple but competing functions of assessment. And some of these are competing with regards how, why and when we assess students learning. And Thompson and Zhao in, in 2012 talked of the learning outcomes race. And this was, you know, what value do universities add to, us, to students as measured in the outcomes? But assessment is not about measuring learning. It plays a pivotal role in how students learn and what they learn. And research has already shown that some students do better with continuous assessment and are more likely to complete a course. Um, there was a time when the earlier you could put in an assessment point, the better. You would grab the student by the grade and pull them into completion. Um, so retention was a strong driver for certain assessment tasks. But Retention for students who are actually paying substantive fees is about enjoying their learning and enjoying the assessment process to demonstrate their learning. So we also know that students orientate their learning approach to their understanding of the learning task. So my interest in assessment is through the learning lens and to break through the assessment process where students become highly skilled at negotiating pedagogical codes or where they prepare assignments based on what they think we want or how they try to maximize the grade. My view is that students will maximize their grade if they concentrate on learning and only if our assessments portray this message. I am just putting this talk in context um, and you will see why and we are all in the same novel situation and so it's a time where um, understanding ourselves, self-assessment and ipsative assessment is so important, and this will show you why. So the question posed by Baud and Soler is poignant because it's a pre-COVID question that prepared people for change, complexity, and a new order. We all operate effectively when we develop an understanding of self-assessment and ipsative assessment to deal with novel problems that we are not trained in. And that's the whole point of self-assessment. So the ideas and practical suggestions here have not changed as a result of the global pandemic. However, how we see and work with our students at the moment has changed. The way we teach might look different at the moment, but the principles of assessment remain the same authentic, meaningful, relevant learning and assessment tasks. So over the past 20 years, we've seen a distinct paradigm shift in higher education. We've gone from the instruction paradigm that emphasizes delivering lectures, providing students with the means to learn, with students get a sense that learning's about filling up the brain and assessment is about measuring that learning. And so assessment methods in universities have traditionally been more the essays, written assignments, tests and examination that determine whether and by how much a student has learn, learned. And ironically, these assessment approaches direct the, the student's attention to proving what they know and can apply rather than improving the way they learn. So we've moved from that towards a learning paradigm in which the emphasis is no longer on the means but on the end. We're looking at supporting the learning process of students. And in particular, it's not necessarily the learning skills we are promoting, but the assessment literacy and assessment skills for students' own lifelong learning. I became interested in the backwash effect of assessment when I started to explore policy documents on assessment and the student's experience of assessment and the student's just strategic approaches to their assessment. And backwash is a term used by Lewis Elton in the late 80s to refer to the effects assessment has on student learning. In other words, when students' learning is guided by the assessment to come and the objectives being assessed become the students' own learning objectives. So there is still the tendency for students to go straight to the assessment tasks and see if they understand them what they are and the relative weighting of each task. And some students will also go online and figure out certain courses based on the assessments. 
often with limited knowledge of what these mean. And therefore, this powerful backwash effect that assessment has on teaching and learning is still present. And as Baud notes, it also represents um, the, some aspects of university policies on assessment. So given all this and what we know, we could at least change the assessments, given that this remains a powerful force. So rather than swim against the tide, what if we surf in on it? Given that assessment is a strategy students use to get through their course, how many, and they ask how many assessment exercises there are, what are they worth? As educators, we also need to focus on assessment and give it as much attention as curricular and pedagogical content. In tertiary or higher education, it's not that we don't have enough information about assessment. We have a full suite of functions of assessment, norm reference, peer reference, criterion reference, and roles that assessment can play in learning, like ipsative assessment, self-assessment, formative, summative. And we have indicators of quality. We have um, reliability and validity, including consequential validity or the effect of assessment on students themselves. But we must be asking, not necessarily assessment fit for purpose, but assessment for whose purpose. And so it's about balancing assessment methods to work for learning and in our program, the, the one I'm going to talk about, we use a combination. And I'm exploring particularly today, ones that have promise for the future. Um, I have been influenced over the years by a number of propositions and reforms in higher education. And I have been playing around with um, practical applications or this theory into practice of assessment. So how do we actually do that? especially when we're wanting to move more of a focus onto the ontological approach, the who am I, who am I becoming, you know, what are my studies preparing me for? Um, and that is around also students' identity. If you go into the assessment futures and look at the assessment futures in 2010, you know, what is it about assessment today? Have we seen these seven propositions for assessment reform in higher education actually in practice because there is still a really important component on all of these propositions. There are also the key conceptual features of assessment in higher education and I think these are key to where we're trying to get to especially around sustainable assessment and the whole point around sustainable assessment is that students can go on assessing themselves well after the course has finished. Benjamin Franklin once said um, in the Paul Richards Improved Almanac, uh, 1750, evidently, um, there are three things extremely hard. One is steel, one is diamond, and the other is to know thyself or to know oneself. And so the actual, the hardest form of assessment is self-assessment. It's easy enough to create assessment assignments around essays or tests or examinations, but self-assessment for students and teachers alike is one of the more challenging forms of assessment. But we all know students whose identity is grade related and the feedback that they receive, whether in summative or formative form, is interpreted based on their beliefs about themselves. And of course, it contributes into one's self-efficacy for that subject. So pulling all those ideas together, if so far, if we are to shift students' focus from the grade towards their learning, we have responsibility to ensure that the assessment tasks and approaches steer them to learning, not the grade. There is a saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. However, you can put salt in its food. Um, I'm not sure what my vet colleagues would think of that, but the idea is that we can use assessment to encourage a deeper approach to learning. And if, if I just go back for a minute and, and we think about this, the COVID-19 pandemic, when it, start, well, when it first came through uh, majorly in early 2020, two years ago, 
we had a novel situation presented globally. We had to use what we know and the knowledge of those around us. So in New Zealand, at least, the medical staff, scientists, epidemiologists, economists, and politicians scrambled to make sense of it, and each took their position. We relied heavily on our epidemiologists and scientists to understand and predict what was happening, and the medical teams, doctors, nurses, paramedics, to keep people well. While all these people had specific training, no one had lived through such an event and therefore needed to provide feedback, listen and self-assess the situation of those around them and who could contribute what and make judgments about what to do. So our supermarket workers and those frontline workers were all learning how to do their job in difficult, challenging and unique times. And this is sustainable assessment in action. And it's where the development of self-assessment skills to be solution focused when a novel situation arises that we've not been trained in comes to the fore. So I'm going to show you a few assessment examples in practice and some of the students' responses over the years. Interestingly, I first noticed the incredible different self-assessment made was when I was teaching in a contemporary certificate of policing, which at the time was compulsory for first year police. They had completed several courses across law, criminal psychology, and the one I was teaching on was called Understanding People. For the police, completing the course, this was another certificate to gain, one they had no choice, and they tended to read the material and regurgitate the content, often not able to demonstrate their full understanding because they tried to write in a formal way. I added a self-assessment component after each module where they self-assess their learning based on the module, but in relation to life on the beat. The difference was extraordinary. And given the numbers we had enrolled in the course, there were at least 10 tutors involved in the marking and all said how the self-assessment component was the most interesting, enlightening and enjoyable component to mark because they could see the learning. The examples I'm going to show you are from education and the education examples, but equally they can apply, be applied in other disciplinary areas, areas. The key point I want to make is that students want assessments that tell us who they are, what their knowledge is, how their learning is influencing their working and professional lives and celebrating new ways of thinking and doing things. And from a phenomenographic view of learning, Learning is about changing the way you see something. So the first example is enabling students to develop their own quality criteria. So I was building on the work of Torrance and Pryor, who talks about the marking criteria can have two components. There can be the task criteria, which is understanding what the purpose of the task is, what constitutes the, staff, the task, and that's the university role. And then there's the quality criteria. That's the criteria for assessment in relation to what would represent effective completion of the task. And students contribute to the quality criteria. They identified it and used in the assessment of their work. So for example, quality criteria for one student might be around incorporating child rights, or for another student, it might be they want to demonstrate indigenous knowledge and, and how that, that is seen in practice. Or for us in New Zealand, they might want to show the Te Ao Māori worldview. So, so they would have focused on a particular quality criteria. Then the marker uses the task criteria, what the task was, alongside the student's identified quality criteria and use this lens to mark the work. This was a new partnership approach for students when this was first done. And for many, they wanted to know if they got the quality criteria right. However, once they realised it really was the criteria to develop, it changed their approach to learning. So here is a student. I developed the quality criteria. If I am told what the criteria is, I want it at the beginning. But when I am coming up with the quality criteria, I want to think about my work more deeply. I asked myself, are you developing the criteria at the end because you want to match it? 
in my thinking, it was more about what have I learned from the whole process? What I have learned. What have I learned and reflecting on what I am doing? What was I aiming to do? In the process of doing the assignment, you're learning on the way. So it changes the way you think about the assignment at the beginning. It was difficult developing quality criteria, but so worthwhile. It meant you really had to think about what you were doing and you couldn't follow a prescribed path. So one of the things that struck me with this particular um, partnership with students was that we always present criteria prior to them undertaking an assessment. And almost every student found that through learning during the process of undertaking the assessment, that the quality criteria emerged. And it's really made me question about at what point should students get the criteria that they're developing for understanding their work and for having their work marked. Um, in the next two, in the next example, I'm going to um, talk about introducing a, an assignment where the students had to develop a YouTube clip. Um, I tried it across three courses, um, an undergraduate course on teaching and learning in everyday settings, and then a master at course, and then a post-master at course for educational psychology interns. So as an assessment task, it served different purposes from introducing the idea of teaching in informal settings based on students' interests. So some did YouTube clips on sports or how to recycle materials in your flat or a cooking clip based on their favorite recipe. And then they drew on theories of learning, cultural competence or cultural components, intergenerational learning. And then they needed to observe someone learning from the YouTube clip they had developed. And then we did them in the master at level and then in the post master at level where the YouTube clip was based around an aspect of the educational psychology knowledge that could be used with by other professionals or parents of children needing support or for the children themselves. So I am going to try and show you an example of really briefly, but I have to do something like, um, I have to stop sharing and go back in. This first one is from a master at student. Hopefully you can see it. My name is Joe. Today I'm going to show you how to make a paper popper, just like this, which you can use to make a loud sound. All you need is a piece of paper. Okay, let's get started. First, you need to fold the paper like this. And then use your finger to press the fold line. And after that, you just fold it again in the same way. I'm going to stop sharing that one because I was just going to show you the end clip and you won't have time to learn how to make a paper popper. Um, so that was one example, and I'm just going to show you another example of now an intern psychologist. They have all given permission, by the way. Externalizing is a powerful technique that can help a child to control their behavior. Externalizing is part of narrative therapy and was developed by David Epstein and Michael White. Narrative therapy provides a method of helping children and adults to reframe their stories regarding their problems. Rather than focusing on negative problems, children and adults are prompted to look for the times when their problem behaviour was absent in order to acknowledge that they can sometimes have control over their problem behaviour. It also helps to separate them from their problems so that they no longer need to feel like they are the problem. And as a result, it can be a very powerful technique particularly for children. It has to work quite quickly because it helps to reduce the shame that the child suffers from feeling that they're bad. So to summarize, externalizing is a technique that comes from narrative therapy. 
can be a very powerful technique because it encourages the child to reconsider themselves as able to control the problem behaviour. It separates the behaviour from the child, thereby lessening the shame of fear, and it enables the adults in the child's life to come alongside the child rather than being in conflict. So you can see that there are two quite different approaches that students um, have approached in terms of them creating a YouTube clip. And these are not YouTubers. Um, so they have had to learn how to develop new skills in order to demonstrate their learning. But the interesting thing was that for, for all of them, I mean, I've never seen two, two uh, YouTube clips the same across all the cohorts of students. Um, we definitely see the student in the learning. And for that first student, um, his YouTube clip was actually to teach his 11 year old son how to make a paper popper that his own father had taught him back in China. And the interesting thing was he said is that his son started asking him questions. What else did your dad teach you? What, why did he teach you that? What, what, what other things can you tell me about, you know, your dad? So um, that in writing it up, he was saying that there was a cultural, culture related knowledge, which may not be directly connected to what his son is learning in school now, but it's helping him understand where he comes from and establish a link to what he is doing now in New Zealand. In that second clip where the Ed Psych interns was, was using narrative therapy, for example, I asked her about her views on that um, assignment. And I said I was, uh, was it you know, okay to use it today? And, and these, her response was, not only could we use it, but she said that it turned out to be really useful due to the lockdown. So that made me feel better about it. Plus, I do love a creative task. I think as an assessment task, it would be hard to do well if you didn't know what you were talking about. So it's an efficient way of testing that out. And I, I've just highlighted that because that is the whole point of an assessment task is how can we help our students, you know, show, demonstrate, test out their knowledge. And, and she's basically saying you wouldn't have been able to do that if you didn't know what you were talking about. In a, um, across the cohort of um, students, um, a brief survey went out to them last year just to ask them about the YouTube clip assignment. And it was asking them whether it enabled them to demonstrate their learning in more equitable ways. So we're so used to doing the those people who are good at writing essays or are good at taking tests, maybe a challenge more in doing more novel type assignments or assessments. And so it was, you know, did it allow you to, sh to show your learning? Um, so 37% said yes, it did. And 28% and said in some ways. And it was interesting, the in some ways were things like um, students were saying it allowed us to show our personality more. It allowed humour to come into it. Um, I could demonstrate my learning in a way that I was freed from APA. Um, so they still did a little brief critique about it, and we did get a little bit of written work alongside that. But it, it might be a way to show learning that students can do in ways that they, they would not normally or typically be able to show in a formal written assignment. This was one of the comments from the survey. Um, and the, I, I think this is sustainable assessment in action because the students don't necessarily realise what they've learned or the skills they've learned until well after the course, and then they use them beyond the course uh, content. So this next example, the third example, I'm going to show you about uh, self-assessment. And ipsative assessment is where the students identify their own learning goals and their own assessment. But I, I just want to make a quick note about ipsative assessment, because sometimes ipsative assessment is described in sports terms as your personal best. And this might be a useful way to start exploring ipsative assessment, but then a deeper understanding is needed because otherwise a PB assumes a measurement of some kind. And what would the students measure? You know, grades, I got a B and then an A minus, so my PB is better. Or can we support ipsative assessment in terms of the students' understanding and learning? 
And this is why there's such a strong link to self-assessment, which by nature requires the learning learner to establish their goal um, and not the course they're undertaking. I have trialed a range of self-assessment tasks with students over the years. Um, and I'm gonna to quickly touch on two here. One in particular that enabled students to look back on their learning in order to look forward. So if we were looking at um, ipsative or self-assessment, the idea is it should be anywhere, anytime, any design. So um, there has been research around this and, and in developing it, um, we need to extend it. So the involvement of learners in making judgments about their own learning but also about their own goals. And it is conducive to deep learning, but also to deep self-assessment. Sustainable assessment is about know thyself, and we know that is the hard um, aspect uh, to support students with. So ultimately, I'm going to use Calvin Tan here, where he talks about lifelong learning requires self-assessment skills. So in order to be a lifelong learner, we need to encourage students to be lifelong assessors as well. So here's, here's, um, here's a couple of examples. Now, the students had, done, had just completed a 5,000-word essay, so a very traditional form of, of assignment on learning theories and their understandings of the theoretical positions of the different ways to understand learning, you know, whether it was from a behaviourist, cognitive, sociocultural or Indigenous theories of learning. They'd completed these assignments and three weeks later, they got a self-assessment task posted on the online forum. Write your own theory of learning in 14 words. You know, no more, no less, but in 14 words. And we got an impressive array of theories of learning that belong to the students. And as a self-assessment task, it was self-assessing the understanding of learning. So I'm not talking self-marking or self-grading at all when I'm talking self-assessment. Now, the following year, another cohort of students had done the very similar task of doing the, the essay, developing their understandings of learning. And so rather than do that same assessment task with them, I tried out another one. And we had a number of markers involved. And I got the and, and faculty staff spent a lot of time writing feedback. You know, there's a lot of written feedback that is given to students and they engage it with it in varying degrees. So what I had done was ask every marker to challenge the students somewhere on their written assignment and to then pose the question, what do you think? So the markers all put somewhere on the assignment they were marking a, a challenge to that student, and then what do you think? Now, typically, this would be rhetorical in that we would not expect an answer, nor would the student necessarily respond verbally or in writing. And in fact, they might not even engage with their specific challenge. So in the self-assessment activity, the students were asked to go back to their earlier assignment. So their self-assessment activity was three weeks later and they were asked to find their specific challenge. They were asked to find that question, what do you think? And then they were to respond to that in 250 words. So in other words, the self-assessment became personalized and individualized, but it was teacher directive. So for those of you who were looking for Where's Wally? Um, essentially, then, this created the Where's Wally effect, where students needed to search for their challenge created in the earlier assignment. So one of the uh, responses from the students around self-assessment was this. And this notion of Self-assessment means it's an ongoing process, which is exactly what we need. So we almost need to train students into seeing self-assessment as an ongoing process. There's no fuel, I'm finished. It's keep going and understand your learning. I'm only going to point to this one in relation to this, this last bit where the intern's talking about 
wanting to be able to show we are learning as opposed to showing that we are able to learn exactly what they, the university, want you to learn. Ultimately, then, the idea is that we need to explore our own principles when developing assessment practices. So um, Bald and Falchikov have outlined five principles to consider when developing assessment practices. Uh, and I've interpreted these here, and I've added a sixth one. Um, and these principles acknowledge the influence that assessment practices have on the way students learn and what they choose to attend to. And when working out your own assessment tasks in your own context and discipline, I think one of the first things you need to do is develop your own principles. So for assessment to work for learning, we actually need to understand learning as a phenomenon. And then within your own areas of expertise and knowledge base, we also need to recognize our diversity of students and their conceptions of learning because their conceptions of learning count and there will be distinct variation in what learning means across the student cohort and therefore what assessment means and how assessment can demonstrate that learning. So my question, how can we use assessment to work for learning? In simplest terms, we need to play around with innovative and sustainable assessment practices and approaches and then develop an evidence base on the impact this assessment has on learners and for learners. That means that we need to recognize the students as learners and assessors. So our students are as much the assessors as they are the learners. And we need to develop student assessment literacy in order to do that. And in order for students to continue self-assessing and assessing long after the course has finished. So in order to tie all that together, we engage students as partners in the assessment process. I guess our question then is, is our assessment interesting for students and have we prepared them for the unknown or the novel? So I'm going to leave you with a couple of job interview questions. Uh, the first one was an, a job interview from Apple and the second one was a Google a job interview question and so that we can move on to the discussion that second one the person was playing monopoly thank you okay so i can take questions thank you so much rosanna sorry i'm trying to um turn my video on there we go um thank you so much that was so stimulating we've got lots of questions on the q a but also in the chat I was chuckling at the end there about whether I would have got those jobs or not. I don't think I would have. But, yeah, lots of really interesting ideas. Um, just trying to think of where to start, really. So I might start with the questions in the Q&A. For those of you who've popped questions in the chat as well, either put them into the Q&A or I'll work through the chat as well. Um, so starting with the first question I've got here, and this might be a bit of a leading question, but it'd be interesting to see what you think. How do in-person closed book limited time exams work or not for students learning? And how do you work with academics who are resistant to considering alternatives? So maybe if I take that first part of the question, which is, well, the first question, do you think what you're proposing in terms of assessment working for learners doesn't fit mm. within particular types of assessment design? No, I, I actually think that in-person, closed book, limited time exams have their role. Um, we're all working. Um, every profession has a time where they have a time-limited notion to address questions or to make decisions. Um, and so it's actually a skill and a strategy to learn, to learn to work under pressure, to learn to pull together what information is important, um, and so I, I actually think that if it's done well, it still has a role. And, and I remember um, one of my first going way, way back, a closed book that I had, closed book, um, well, actually no, it was an open book because I had prepared so well for this particular exam when I was doing my own master years ago. And I'd put in all the coloured stickies and I had it all beautifully ready for the exam. And I had a 
little puppy at the time that had ripped into that entire book before the exam, you know, overnight. But what was interesting is having done that prep, I almost didn't need the book. And so, um, you know, I, I, I do feel like that still has a role and we shouldn't dismiss it. Um, but it's about helping students understand what they're learning through that assessment process. Yeah. A literal example of dog ate my homework. I love it. Oh, yeah. It really <laughs> um, was. So the second question that Lincoln poses, which actually fits in well with Dave's as well, is how do you shift colleagues um, practices, if you like, who are deeply, deeply committed to wanting students to demonstrate the knowledge that they have been taught rather than demonstrate what students have learned from the, for themselves? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because uh, we have a, a, um, an organisation here in New Zealand called Aka for tertiary writers. And they had me running one day workshops on self-assessment alone with tertiary educators. And it was, it was more a lack of understanding rather than a resistance. And so sometimes um, I think the resistance needs to be met with education or to be met with, here's how it could work in your discipline or here how it could work in your trade, for example. So, um, and, and colleagues I work with, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I have fantastic colleagues and, and stuff could well be online. So <laughs> um, that, 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 um, that there's not that resistance, uh, but I think what might come into play is our universities that have just got so time poor. So we're teaching more, we're, um, we've got greater student cohorts, um, people have um, the workload issues, etc., and so the ways that I've been playing around with assessment is is ensuring that we can keep it manageable for everyone as well. And I think that might be part of the resistance. It's interesting you mentioned the uh, university structures because there was a question in the chat around how do you manage the allowing students to pose their own quality criteria when everything has to be predefined so far in advance. So how do you do that? Oh, it's, that I, I've written about that because um, from a university policy, I don't think any of us could get through that. So, so it's the task criteria that is, um, that is put up. So what is the nature of this task? But the quality criteria has... Um, can be done with the students at the time. So we've still got some criteria up, but not necessarily the quality criteria. The other thing is that I have had students involved in creating assessment rubrics. And that's another issue where rubrics are often have to be predetermined and pre-designed. So it might be that one cohort will develop the rubric that will be then be used for the next cohort. So, so they've had, we've had massive student input into developing the rubric, but then we have it for subsequent cohorts as well. That's fabulous. Um, related to that, you mentioned the idea that, um, you know, staff are often resistant, are not resistant per se, but perhaps don't have the knowledge. And you, you, you mentioned the idea around assessment literacy. Where, one of the questions is around where does feedback literacy fit into it? Do you see it as a subset of assessment literacy or is it something that you work on as well? Is that for students or for staff? Um, I mean, you were talking about staff before and their knowledge, so that's their staff oh. assessment literacy, but in yeah. terms of the students? Well, for staff, for a start, um, I think everything has to be posed in a way that, that we, don't, we don't put students um, off reading it and that they just throw it away or, or think, you know, I, I can't do this. So, so feedback literacy does need to be framed in a quite a positive way if we're going to challenge students, and, and that's um, a really important part. But we've, we've had um, feedback from students about teachers' feedback that even when they don't get a good grade, if the feedback is really helpful and they really get it, they'll actually respond to that feedback. And so some of the things that we've done in, in our program is 
share the sort of feedback that students are really acknowledging. So it just gives ideas about, oh, that's another way to frame it. And, and it's not that we're saying everything's great. We, you know, you might be really challenging a concept or challenging a practice, but there are ways you can do it to support students. And then with regards to the students' point of view, um, I was actually just teaching this morning and we, we were exploring the fact that the way students interpret their feedback, they need to sort of maybe stand back first. I mean, it's like any academics getting um, peer reviews of their journal articles, for example. It's the same sort of thing as, as interpreting what is this marker actually saying? And is it that I haven't expressed it um, in the way, in, with clarity? Or is it that my understanding I need to work with developing a different and you know a new understanding so but I think feedback literacy is part of assessment literacy yes mm. um, and it sounds like you do that as incorporated within the subject as opposed to standalone before as part of transition into university is that correct in addressing uplifting student assessment and feedback literacy Sorry, could you say that? Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm wondering about how you, it sounds like you tackle improving students' assessment and feedback literacy within yeah. the subject or within the task that you're doing as opposed to standalone in transition programs, for example. Yeah, I, I mean, the students coming into universities now have, have come to an understanding of what assessment does to them and how they get the grades. Um, and so assessment literacy is actually something that is um, quite an intentional, um, I guess, practice that, that we need to do that we don't necessarily have time for. You know, there's lots of effort on how to write a grade assignment or how to be test, you know, savvy, but actually understanding what the, how the assessment links to their own learning is, is I guess, something that we just need to keep working on. Yep. Um, there's a couple of questions here around the design specifically of the two-part rubric that you mentioned. And yeah. I just wanted to know on a very practical level. So there's yeah. one part that's created by academics for assurance of learning, which you described yeah. as the task criteria. And then there's the quality criteria, which are developed yeah. together. Um, and then the grading happens for both. Yeah, I just, I want to separate out the rubric that was developed by students and the criteria because that was a different exercise and, and the quality criteria. So we were working with postgrad students and so we're not, we weren't working with undergrads where there might be like, you know, 300 to 500 students in a, in a cohort. So it was a case of when the assignment came in that they had identified their quality criteria. So we were looking at the assignment and the quality criteria might have been around um, their ability to um, look at um, indigenous knowledge or indigenous understandings of something, or it might be the quality criteria was around how community partnership was developed. So, so it, it's really just means that it draws the marker's attention to what that student valued. And it's quite a different approach than saying, this is what we as a university value, and you, you know, join the dots, follow the dots, and, and, and basically develop what we have already pre-established. So it's, it's, it's an interesting form of um, bringing in student partnership in a way that it's not as time, you know, costly as, as you might think, because, um, yeah, it's just creating another lens. And it's, and then we don't do the, you know, the, the rubric in that same way. And in fact, we've got a master assessment course and um, where there's one assignment where we will not give a rubric. Um, and that's trying to to move students away from having such a predetermined notion of what is expected. And some of the best assignments come out of that work as well. Thank you for that. So 
I guess it makes sense to follow on that with the question around if you were dealing with larger cohorts, how might yeah. you scale up? Yeah. Okay, so with the larger cohorts, and, and that initial course um, with the police was a very large cohort. So we had over 300 in that because we just we had both um, educators in that as well as the, the, the young constables um, in their first year out who had to do it. It was compulsory. So with that one, the self-assessment was more um, around a 250-word um, uh, exploration of their learning in relation to a module and in relation to their work. So they would bring in their specific work. So that wasn't around um, rubrics. That that was a more a self-assessment example, but it worked with a very large cohort um, and it meant that there was no two the same. Um, and and they we actually had to change university policy for this to enable us to give 5% for the self-assessments across that course. Um, our current university, my current university, Messi, uh, we can do that anyway. So it's so um, I think universities are becoming more receptive, especially as you know, our future is not, we're not training students for the past, we're training students for the future. Um, and so there has to be more of that dynamic approach uh, to assessment. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question around, I'm concerned with how best students can track their learning journey because I want to help them to overcome the forgetting curve. Is one of the benefits of this sort of assessment that learners produce a keepable artifact? I guess, how do you? Oh, um... We, we have a number of assignments across the program that are what we call give back assignments. So they are they in and of themselves create a resource for the community. So um, one year um, in group students created um, books for children or for teachers. Um, we've got a concept in one of the courses that students were looking at about Whanaungatanga. And... Um, the children's book was called Where is Whanaungatanga? And it was about a child going to school looking for Whanaungatanga and not understanding it was actually everywhere around him. So, so that has since been used and turned into a digital artefact and, and used in a way that students can see a real value for what they're producing. So, I mean, many assignments and essays just get thrown out or maybe kept and for a few years and then 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 they get binned um, but but these are living these are living assignments or living living resources so those YouTube clips um, we've had in the um, the ones who do it for the intern psychology we've had psychologists in education asking for those clips for their own PD um, in the Ministry of Education so you know, it's, it's all about um, ass assignments and assessments have a much broader concept than they might typically have had. And it seems to align very much with that notion, you know, you mentioned around the ontolo ontological concept of, of assessment is putting yourself yeah. into that and seeing how you fit in, how you portray you know what you value and 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 how you orient to society or the community or whatever it is that you're trying to do with that assignment mm -hmm. um that are beyond uh let's get the grade to get the certificate to get out of here sort of thing mm. um we have another question around Presumably some students find writing quality criteria easier and more challenging mm. for their learning than others. Mm. How do you manage assessments where the student constructed quality criteria needs improvement? Mm. Eventually you've addressed this um, mm. a little bit already. Yeah, and I guess what I would add is that um, for a student, quality criteria is where they are at at the moment. So um, let's work with where they are and through that quality criteria, um, you know, there might be some feedback around what they're looking for or what they're looking at or what their focus is. But clearly for that student, it has value at that time. And so that's what we try to work with. 
Um, interestingly, with all of this, is a point that I'd make is we've never had an issue with with um, in these self assessments or the YouTube clips or the writing about the YouTube clips, which also have a like a fifteen hundred word critique. We've never had an issue of plagiarism around that. And I was thinking about that the other day, and clearly they're not necessarily things that can be plagiarised, but the, the key difference is that in these sorts of assessments, students put themselves into the assessment, whereas when students are plagiarising, they're taking themselves out of the assessment. And I think that's the difference is we're trying to draw them in. I really like that distinction. Just conscious of time, um, what I might do is wrap up this um, symposium formally um, and, you know, we can continue for anyone who wants to stay on and ask a few more questions, we can do that. But for everyone who's got to rush off to another um, meeting or what have you, um, I might take this opportunity to really thank Rosanna for this fascinating talk. I really take away from it this idea that we need to develop lifelong learners and assessors. You know, it's um, such a fundamental part of the becoming process uh, and being able to manage the new um, and, and frees you of APA. I do love that, um, <laughs> that quote. Um, so if you've registered, you will get the recording um, and we will also have a blog post. I also want to do a really quick plug in for our next symposium event, which will be on the 15th of March. And that's being presented by Dr. Joanna Tai from Cradle. And she will be talking about her Neshi, the, the project she read that was funded, led by, that was funded by Neshi around inclusive assessment. So please do join us for that. And if you want to stay on and ask some more questions, then please do. We can spend a few more minutes chatting with Rosanna. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat, Rosanna, but lots and lots of appreciation, lots of thank yous. Um, I think the practical as well as, you know, the, the seeing someone who's done it, who has gotten their hands dirty and have, you know, changed policy, assessment policy in the university is really inspiring. Um, I wanted to, one of the um, participants share the story in the chat around how they had implemented something similar to what you were describing, where their students were more involved in developing uh, criteria and rubrics and they were really upset that then they didn't get that chance in other subjects. Um, oh. And so it really kind of had that um, bitter aftertaste, if you like, when they moved on to other other subjects I don't know whether you've had that experience at all um well no but not not from the students telling us about that in fact we usually have the reverse that students find it quite challenging when they're invited into the assessment it's 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 almost like oh that's your job you know you tell us what the assessment is and we'll do it we've got to move on and um and so we actually work quite hard at, at the, um, the students' role in the assessment. So, But it's good to know that, that students are enjoying it elsewhere mm. as well. But, but it becomes a force for change, doesn't it, if the students are demanding to be involved in assessment and, and to be in the assessment, not outside of it, then maybe that will also be another um, driver for change, if you like. So we've mm. still got 126 yeah. people. If, if you want to add any additional questions, please do anything in the chat. Otherwise, um, I might wrap up the session because it's also 5 p.m. for you, isn't it, Rosanna? So you probably have other things to get to. Um, if there are more questions that come through, though, that's fine. I mean, it's interesting that, uh, you know, one of the things that we're... Um, been talking about here at Cradle is assessment representation and how can we put the mm. students into assessment a lot more so that who they are can be showcased in terms mm. of the artifacts but also the the you know the the transcript you get when you finish university it tells you so little about who they are and what what they can do and um in terms of communicating to employers. So there's a lot of food for thought in your talk mm. that I will take away and, and, and look into around 
yeah, showcasing their personalities and humour and, and being able to, to, mm. to communicate that more broadly. Yes, and I think one thing too is developing confidence. You know, if our assessments don't help students become confident in their own understanding of their learning, and all employers are looking for confident, you know, young people coming into um, the workplace as well. So uh, it does help with confidence. So I think maybe we will call it a day. I'm not seeing any additional questions. I think you've answered them all fantastically. Thank you again so much. And I hope you have a really lovely rest of evening. I will. Thanks so much, Robert. Thanks, Rosanna. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.